Good uh, afternoon, everybody, dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends. Um, welcome to Austin University Campus Brussels, both in person and virtually. My name is Mariolina Di Antonio. I am a professor of European and Comparative Administrative Law at the Law Faculty of Maastricht University and also co-director of Campus Brussels, together with Paul Stevenson here also with me, who is an assistant professor of political science at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. We will be um, moderating today's event. Um, Brussels, um, the Campus Brussels of Maastricht University is an interfaculty hub at the service of the university community to expand our educational offer, strengthen the impact of our research and contribute to the development of our university's international profile as the university the European University of the Netherlands. Today's event is part of a special five-day talk series dedicated to the 30th anniversary of the Maastricht Treaty. You see a beautiful virtual fireplace uh, behind you and on the screen. But I can assure you, if you were a fan of Brussels, you see we have many fireplaces around. Our speakers here can confirm this. Um, so today's uh, event is part of a special series of five praise talks. Um, and as you know, the Maastricht Treaty has paved the way for a myriad of legal and policy development in the process of European integration. This discussion is the second event um, within our series. In focus today are development related to social policy and the protection of workers in the single market something that touches every day's life of probably all of us on screen and in the room today. The Master Treaty was instrumental in advancing EU integration in this field by, for example, introducing the Protocol on Social Policy that has since then upgraded a number of times until today with the European pillar social rights as the lighthouse to guide future uh, initiatives. This evening we will discussing not only the past of European social policy, but also the present and the future, with a number of um, speakers uh, here with us online and on, uh, on campus. For this purpose, we have the pleasure and the honor to welcome our lineup of speakers. So, a um, member of the European Parliament, Philip Lennart, uh, welcome today uh, at Campus Brussels, and we are particularly pleased to have you today Day as also former and very active UN alumnus. So thank you very much uh, uh, with us for being with us today. And together uh, with your Lennart, we have an editor from the from Maastricht University, Chai Spong from Groningen University, and online Saskia Montebovi, uh, also colleague of mine from Maastricht University. Thank you all very much for honoring us with your presence. And before we proceed, my colleague Paul uh, will shortly introduce each of the speakers before we kick off the uh, discussion. Uh, yes. Thanks, by Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marilina. It's fantastic to be hosting this second event in our Maastricht 30th anniversary uh, treaty series. Um, we've got four fantastic speakers this evening, and I'm delighted to welcome them here to Campus Brussels. First of all, in the center, we have Jeroen Lenars, who has been a member of the European Parliament since 2014, um, a member of the European People's Party on behalf of the Dutch Christian Democrats. Jeroen studied European studies at Maastricht University, where he successfully completed his bachelor and master's degrees. After his studies, he did an internship at Ria Oman's office in the European Parliament, where he continued as a consultant in the field of foreign affairs, human rights, cross-border healthcare, social affairs, and employment. And he works mainly on two portfolios that are relevant to the two committees that he's a member of, Employment and Social Affairs and Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, two European Parliament committees um, that are extremely important. We have, um, on oh, next to Marilina, we have Dr. Anne Peter van der May, who is Professor of European Social Law at Maastricht University's Faculty of Law. He is former academic director of the Master Programs European Law School, Globalization and Law and International Law. He's a graduate of the Faculty of Law of the University of Groningen, completed the postgraduate course for researchers in international and European law, 
at TMC Astor Institute in The Hague, and he obtained his PhD from Maastricht University with a thesis entitled Free Movement of Persons Within the European Community, Cross-Border Access to Public Benefits. Next to me on my left, we have Dr. Geispert Fonk, who is Professor of Social Security at the University of Groningen. He studied law in Amsterdam and London before receiving a PhD for his research in the field of European social law at the University of Tilburg. Having been head of the Department for Legal Affairs at the Social Insurance Bank in Amstelveen from 1993 to 2006, he became Professor of Social Security Law in Groningen. Furthermore, since 1990, he has held a part-time chair in Social Security Law at the Faculty of Law of the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. His interests are in Social Security Law, Public Law, Human Rights Law, and present research interests lie in poverty and the rule of law in the welfare state. We're also joined on screen this evening by Dr. Saskia Montebove, who is Assistant Professor at Maastricht University's Faculty of Law and Tilburg University. Her educational interest lies in the social security protection of workers in the Netherlands and in cross-border situations, in particular the study of the Dutch social security law and European coordination regulations. And this includes a focus on social protection or the lack of protection of flexi workers, solo self-employed workers, platform workers. I think we'll hear more about that this evening. So as you can see, we have an incredible um, lineup of experts, of academics and practitioners here with us this evening. And we're, in, we're, in, we're all set for a very, very enriching discussion. So I'm gonna hand over uh, to uh, Professor Dr. Anne-Peter van der May. Uh, thank you, Paul. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to have a debate on the role of social policy in the European Union and what the EU can do, what should perhaps leave to the member states. Um, the way we proceed, I will give a brief introduction, going back to my state and sketch a little bit what has happened ever since. We'll have a debate on the basis of five or six propositions. Um, and the propositions are not so much related to the historical significance of my state. There are more current issues that are what debated in the European Parliament, in the European institutions. Um, but let me first briefly go back to my state. Um, my state has been crucial for social policy. The other way around, too. Social policy has been crucial for the Maastricht Treaty. Um, you may know that the treaty was politically concluded in December 1991. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, so I should almost... Okay, sorry. Um, the negotiations were concluded ultimately in the old government building uh, in Maastricht. You can see a picture there under the law and major. That's where the negotiations were held and finalized. Um, social policy during the Maastricht negotiations was crucial. And most people remember Maastricht, the creation of the European Union and the creation of the Economic and Monetary Union, the move towards a single currency. But during the negotiations itself in Maastricht, most issues had been settled. Social policy was still the main bone of contention. It was still very controversial. And up until the 9th of December, everybody was doubting whether the Maastricht Treaty would ever be adopted simply because of the dossier on social policy. The idea was a little bit that the law, the president of the commission since five years, um, he had always said that we should deepen monetary integration, perhaps go further with monetary integration, but on condition that there is also a social chapter in the treaty. Basically, we could pursue economic monetary progress, but not to the detriment of workers. Um, for the law, that was an non, it was a must. We needed to have more powers for the union institutions in social policy. It was one big problem, and the problem was called the United Kingdom, presented by the <laughs> major. He said throughout uh, the negotiations, 
no way. I'm not going to accept more powers of the Union for the social policy. You also didn't accept the euro and the economic and monetary union. He basically said no to pretty much everything. Still, this was a problem. For the law versus nature, should social policy be included or not? Now, some of you may wonder what does Heineken mean here? But what Heineken, the poster, the Heineken poster, the field, ultimately was the source of the solution to the problem. Uh, the negotiations in Maastricht took place 9th and the 10th of December. And even on the evening, the night of the 10th, there was no solution. Most involved in the negotiations thought this is not going to work out. We'll never have a much treaty. But then according to anecdotes and stories, in the night of the 10th, in the cafeteria in the old government building, some civil servants, almost depressed, gee, we are not going to have a treaty. We're just making some notes on the backslide of a beer post. Somebody came up with a solution. We're just making some drawings and Many of you will know the solution was ultimately that the 12 member states present at the time agreed that 11, so excluding the UK, would continue with a furthering of social policy at EU level, at the famous protocol and social agreement, which later have been inserted in the treaties eh, by the Treaty of Amsterdam. But social policy was really the main bone of contention during the negotiations and ultimately solved via the coaster. Um, now the other way around, so I described what the relevance of social policy for Maastricht, what has Maastricht now meant for social policy? Now, maybe many things can be said here. Numerous publications have been there on Maastricht and social policy. But if I summarize it, the three main things that Maastricht has done is first of all introduce the co-decision procedure, qualified majority voting, veto power for the parliament, <coughs> on numerous topics of social policy. The current Article 153 of the treaty basically is rooted in the Maastricht Treaty. Um, secondly, European citizenship was introduced in Maastricht. And European citizenship implied, among other things, that not only workers, self-employed persons, should have the right to freedom of movement, but all the union citizens, so also students, students, pensioners, and other economically inactive persons. That, when you look at the slide, so EU citizenship, extension of free movement rights, that requires automatically, I would say more or less, that also the coordination regime for social security, formerly in regulation 1408, now 883, had to be adjusted, updated, to the new situ situation of EU citizens. We come back to that in one or two of the propositions. Um, the second thing quite relevant um, of the master treaty, it, or the third thing I should say after one fight, the competences, EU citizenship, is the role of the social partners. The law from the mid of the 80s had already always emphasized we should not only have a legislative EU activity in Brussels, let's say, but also the social partners, the European social partners should be involved. We have to promote uh, the social dialogue between the European social partners at EU level. Basically also the commission, whenever they come up with a proposal, they have to consult now the partners. There is the possibility that the partners conclude collective agreements, which in principle can be transformed afterwards into EU directives on social policy. Uh, famous examples, I'm not sure whether you can read it on the slides, are the directives on part-time work, fixed-term work, temporary, no, temporary agencies not, but part-time fixed-term work are the main examples of collective agreements which are later transformed in, into, into social legislation. Now, if we briefly look at, this was Maastricht, has it added something? I would say in the first 10, 15 years, definitely yes. In the 90s, there were quite some legislative initiatives, directives I already mentioned, the working time directive comes from that time, other directives were updated. There was yeah, social progress has been made in Brussels, you could say, 
in the first 10 years, roughly speaking, after my stay. Thereafter, it became more difficult. And I'm not totally sure, perhaps Shizun can <coughs> later elaborate on that, that the extension of the broadening of the Union right, towards 27 member states has certainly played a role there. But we see from the 2000s onwards that the legislation became more difficult. Social dialogue also became less efficient. And we moved towards more soft law, the open method of coordination and so forth. This could not go on forever because in 2008, 2009, there we have again a switch which is relevant for social policy, economic financial crisis, which had far reaching implications, especially also for Southern member states. But to cut a long story short, the economic and financial crisis, which has hit all the member states hard, but especially maybe the Southern ones and perhaps the ones in Eastern Europe, ultimately it has led to the European pillar of social rights, which is not a treaty amendment, it is more a bundle of policy propositions and document on how to further, how should we go further with European social policy. And in that context of the European pillar of social rights, we have seen more recently all kinds of initiatives, also for legislation again, on various topics um, which are relevant for especially workers and also economically inactive. Um, you just see some examples here. There's a directive adopting on fair working conditions from 2018, around that time. There are now um, a proposal for a minimum wage. We'll come back to that, a European minimum wage. There are plans for a European minimum income, which Professor Funk will later say something about. <laughs> Um, there is a directive on finding the right work-life balance, giving, especially men, to promote the access of women to the labor market by introducing also paternity leave, parental leave, especially also for the husbands. Um, and quite significant directive, I think. Um, for the rest, uh, now these are the main topics, I could say also the legislative instruments we are going to have a debate about. If later on you at home want to add certain topics, there is the possibility um, that you can always raise your hand, your virtual hand, and then we can include you in the discussion, even though I think we'll do that mainly at the end. Huh? Um, having said that, having sketched a little bit the background, um, I would like to go to the first proposition, and a proposition I understand will be so we, you will look at us, but in the chat, you get the text of the propositions. And the first one, I'll read it out loud. Huh? The first proposition is platform work should qualify as full-fledged work for the purposes of both the right to receive social benefits and the duty to pay contributions. And I ask Saskia Montebovi huh, to give, to introduce the proposition and to give a little background on this topic. And thereafter, I give the floor to the gentleman here to agree or disagree with Saskia. Okay, Saskia? thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can you understand me? Fine. Okay, perfect. Well, you are there with the fireplace and I see also the flower for Christmas already. We are just here in a normal uh, blank room. And uh, I would like to introduce indeed the first uh, proposition. Well, when you discuss a certain topic, you first of, co of course have to discuss the definition itself. Huh? What do we mean by platform work? What's the, what does the concept uh, include? So that clear definition and clear starting point is of course crucial at the definition. I would say today we keep it very broad and we have done the distinction between online platform work and offline. Online, you could say you could scribe to, to a platform and then pick a job for a few seconds or hours or days. And you can think about uh, IC development, for example, or a job for translations or checking information on a website. These are the kinds of online platform work. And the offline are, uh, I think, more clear. These are examples and the deliveries by the food companies, babysitting, catering through a platform, etc. So the question, of course, is, do we have a problem? Is there a problem? 
And if so, yes, what is it? Well, some say, no, there is no problem. Just leave it at the market and the workers and they have to regulate it themselves. But of course, the majority of society said, well, we do have a problem because these workers in general, they do not have a decent job, no decent income and no decent protection. So they do need some extra effort from the society. And so they can be included in the regular schemes of social security and tax law. That is the main, the, the main goal then. Okay, and then the, the other step, the next step would be then how is it regulated nowadays? Well, that depends on the national legislations. We do not have European initiatives here. Uh, well, the initiatives might be there, but there's not a solution, a final solution yet. So we have to look at the national um, initiatives. And you see that some uh, member states are quite far with these uh, legal initiatives and others just uh, are at the start. So we do have some challenges for the financing, for the organization, for the implementation. And I think the main question is here that there is a danger for all these people who have only the small jobs, so they do not, uh, they cannot be included in social security while they do work, of course. And then at the meantime, they also should contribute to the schemes. If we do not regulate it, then we could say, well, all these people in the platform world, they uh, do have that risk of being uh, a working poor worker, insecurity, super flexibility, et cetera. So we do have quite some problems, uh, especially with the income eh? for those who are only working a few days or work uh, hours a week. Well, they can suffer a low income. And then you see that in many countries, we have these minimum thresholds. So people will never come above these thresholds, so they will never get into the national social security system. Of course, they do not pay, they do not pay any contributions, but they do not get any social security protection neither. So I think that we should discuss that also at EU level, as online uh, work, of course, is by definition very cross-border uh, minded. And maybe we could also discuss in the distinction between hobby and activities, like for example, if you sell your clothes, and at the other side, work for real at the, at the platform. So discussing there, of course, also what do we do with uh, some risk like unemployment and accidents at work? How can you organize that for all these people on an online world of in the online world? So what I would like to pose here as uh, the proposition is there should be any action. We should regulate it, but um, it won't be easy because all the national uh, member states, of course, they have their own vision about these regulations. So there is that dilemma of how to tackle it. Okay, maybe I'll leave it here for now for the start of the discussion. Okay, thank you, Saskia. You are referring to national initiatives. Pass on right away to Jeroen. Is this a topic of debate in the parliament? or in Brussels more generally here? No, I, I guess uh, it's, it's certainly a topic in, in the parliament, maybe not, not exactly in, in the context that Saskia now sketched with regards to also the people, the difference between a hobby and a job, uh, the people that are not working enough hours to, to get into the national social security systems, but certainly in the whole framework of um, what's happening with delivery, delivery persons, with Uber drivers, with... Um, for these kind of platform workers, it is a topic because not only is platform work online, as you said, per definition, or very often cross-border, but there's another reason to look at this from the European angle because we see the same issues in all of the member states. You see different court cases being resolved in several member states, quite often, not always, but quite often ruling in favor of the fact that a platform worker has an actual employment relationship with the platform and should be treated as such. So I think it's very important to have uh, a European policy on that. And actually, if I'm not uh, informed incorrectly, the European Commission will come up with a proposal next week uh, actually on how to regulate platform economy. The European Parliament, we have done a lot of work on this already. And the idea, at least from the European Parliament, is that uh, there should be, at least when there is a dispute, there should be a rebuttable presumption that you have an employment relationship and the burden of proof to say that it's not an employment relationship but a self-employment situation should be on the platform. It should not be on the worker because for uh, uh, the law as such, until it's proven otherwise, you have an employment 
relationship. And I think that is very important to stop abuse, to stop um, the, a lot of workers these days having no uh, kind of social protection. Uh, we've seen it with a lot of situations. Right now we see in all the big cities in the Netherlands, also here in Belgium, rapid grocery deliveries. Uh, we see the same issues there. It's only going to increase. Uh, the size of the platform economy will only grow in years to come. So I think now is also the right time to do something about it. And I very much agreed with, with Saskia's last comment saying, well, there is, there's different national systems and the, the member states that don't necessarily agree with each other. Uh, if that would be a reason not to move forward in Europe, we, we would have very little work uh, to do in the end. So I think it's very important to, uh, to take this issue as a crucial issue. If you really want to have a social market economy in the European Union, then this is a crucial issue that you need to tackle. Can I maybe just directly uh, make a remark on that? Of course, it's good to regulate the situation, but it should not only be done for uh, employees. Huh? Like you said, there could be a presumption that those who are working as a platform worker are automatically qualified as an employee, but that even that doesn't really solve the problem of social security because also self-employed people or other atypical workers, they also deserve a protection. So it's not only for the employees. So that's something extra on top of that labor issue. We could say social security is even uh, going higher than that qualification. It doesn't really matter if it is only an employee or not. But for the rest, of course, we agree that there should be done something in the future. Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. can I go ahead. Thank you very much. If I may say one thing about it is that very often when we look at Anna Peter's proposition that everybody should be included in the Social Security, both paying contributions and uh, receiving benefits, I think there is uh, a, a, a very often a little bit of a Bismarckian bias uh, in this proposition, meaning that uh, platform workers should be somehow merged into a typical continental employee uh, insurance benefit schemes. Yeah, so, so this is uh, the, the core. And of course, you can extend these type of schemes also to the self-employed. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, there is a choice whether platform workers should be either uh, uh, self-employed workers or uh, employed workers. But then the uh, 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 social security issue, issue is resolved. But I'd like to point out that underneath, there is perhaps another... Uh, social security angle, which is often forgotten, uh, that there are also schemes that uh, do not necessarily make that distinction between uh, workers, be it employed or self-employed, or non-workers. And we refer to these, uh, this approach, it's Scandinavian, uh, as a, a, a general insurance approach, on the basis of which you are uh, uh, insured when you are a resident. Uh, and that type of broad residential schemes it, within social insurance, I think is a very, very, very good cushion, good solution, good solution to, uh, to adopt uh, new changes in the labor market where you have all these different patterns. So I would suggest that perhaps it's a little bit, well, see a little bit more forward in our thinking and to see to what extent in the future of the 21st century, uh, introducing more general social insurance schemes of a Scandinavian nature, Volksverzekering, as we say in the Netherlands, might be a way forward. But when you put it like that, hmm? mm -hmm. it is a national social security issue. And it's differ enormously from worker-based, residence-based system. And Jeroen is saying, Europe should take initiative, or at least an initiative. Should Europe do that? I understand the need for protecting labor law, social security law, these types of work. But is that not invading too deeply into the national sovereignty economy of the member states in these fields? Should we do it by hard law, soft law, encouraging, or should we perhaps be tough law, imposing? It's such a sensitive thing, I guess. I also think this is this is the <clears throat> this is a recurring debate, of course, in any kind of uh, proposal in the area of social affairs, uh, social security. Uh, we we see the 
the proposal on minimum wages, minimum income there. Right? This, this debate always comes back to a uh, debate on subsidiarity, on competences. But I think in this particular case, um, when it deals with platform workers, uh, if that's the particular case we're talking about here, that there is a sort of a horizontal issue here. It's not only in certain, there might be differences in organization in member states, but the issue is mm -hmm. there. And I think it's also a matter of time before one of these cases eventually ends up at the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice has already developed uh, case law on, on the interpretation of what is a work or what is not, uh, and, and eventually we'll end up there. And it's much better, I think, from a political point of view to, to have a somewhat of a universal approach. How to do that is, of course, always a second question. We'll see what the European Commission comes up with next week. But I prefer a horizontal approach that is widely shared in the EU 27 rather than 27 member states going in their own directions without any kind of clarity whatsoever. We had a long debate in the parliament whether you should create a separate category for platform workers. So you would have, yeah, so you would have employed, self-employed, and then a category in between. But that was in the end not the, the, the choice of the parliament because of that, that creates more confusion, more ambiguity, and it doesn't help anyone in the end. So uh, it is not an easy topic. I do strongly feel that we should look at this at the European level and any input at how to do that is much welcome by the time we're also working on this in the parliament. Yeah. Yes. I also think, you know, when this class this, this classical question that pops up, uh, should it be done by hard law or soft law? I also have a classical response to that. We should do it by both. I mean, there are some elements, I agree with uh, Jeroen, yeah. Uh, that are uh, suitable for being regulated by hard law. And I think particularly the, the definition of what is a employment relationship for these purposes, because there's such a harmonizing trend now at the moment going on in the labor law, case law of the, of the member states, that would be very much suitable for, for a, a, a director at a European level. Yet broader issues like the architecture, of the future architecture of uh, security systems, I think are much more suited for a soft law approach. And indeed, here you can also see what other countries already have set up. Eh? Some countries, some member states are already um, dealing with this topic in the legislation. So you can see, okay, there is the open method of coordination and find out how this works in the other countries and use it as an experiment for the continuation of uh, the de development use what you already have and what, what is done already. And that's both, of course, on social security uh, level and at the tax law level. Of course, these things are, should be taken together in this particular topic. Okay. Anything to add? Well, yes, because it's, it, I'm really pleased that the, the tax law uh, is, 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 is uh, raised, the issue of tax law, because I think also the whole issue of social fiscal allowances Mm -hmm. popping up everywhere uh, need to be taken into consideration uh, from the point of view of architecture or let's say development future of the of the of the, of the social protection systems and uh, yes but these are things that are much more suitable for discussing comparing within a framework of the open method of coordination than, uh, than, than yeah. directive yeah, yeah. I, I think there's we, we could talk about this this uh proposition alone for, for many hours to come. Uh, <laughs> so one thing is also what I think is important is that you also you need to discuss it at the European level because also you see, for instance, in the Netherlands, you might know we had this initiative or at least a wish of the government to uh, counteract sort of bogus self-employment uh, or, or not real self-employment by having sort of a minimum hourly rate that you need to ask as a self-employed person and otherwise you would be considered to be in an employment relationship. And there was huge problems also with the European legislative framework in, in the right freedom of establishment, et cetera. So if you see, there are initiatives in many member states, not all of them are in line with the European legal framework at the moment. So that is another reason, I think, to, to also have this discussion at the European level. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Okay, then I would like to move on. Further, also when we come to minimum wage, That's not the next slide, but the one there after. Okay. If you put it in the chat, so this is the one while at odds with. Yeah? Okay. 
As the proposition as stated here is <laughs> while at odds with the principle of subsidiarity and for substance too vague, the proposal for a directive on adequate minimum wages should be adopted as a matter of urgency. Um, now, you may know the Commission has made a proposal for minimum wages, which is not harmonizing the minimum wages, it is requiring the member states one step clear for setting minimum wage, and secondly, to promote social dialogue between the national social partners on their increasing the level of minimum wages. Um, that proposal is now in the parliament. If I understand it correctly, the social committee has said yes, and now in the very near future, in two weeks from now, it is going to the entire parliament? No, no, no. We, um, well, actually, we have a, a, a sort of a, in the, the, the most recent years, we have developed an informal practice that once it's voted in the committee, we can directly start informal dialogues with the council. Um, if the uh, report as such is not challenged in the plenary, now it was challenged in the November session of the plenary, uh, but there was no majority for the challenge, so we can just start with the uh, informal dialogues, and it doesn't need to go through um, another full plenary uh, procedure. So okay, the, the, but I thought that, uh, uh, what's the name? Jochirius, yep. See, I heard her on the radio saying that 11th of December was then was the plenary, but that has then been... If, if, there, yeah, if, if it would have been challenged last week, that would have, um, uh, that would have happened. It hasn't, so the, the position of the parliament for the moment is the report adopted in the Employment and Social Affairs Committee, mm -hmm. and that will be taken through the trilogues with, um, uh, with the council. And uh, the question, I would, I would rephrase the question, and I would say let's make sure it's not at odds with the principle of subsidiarity anymore, and let's remove the ambiguity and then adopt it as soon as possible. Because, of course, you mentioned Article 153 of the treaty. It has a very specific paragraph, of course, um, not allowing the European Union any competences in the area of pay. Uh, we have the legal opinion from the legal service of the Parliament, from, from the Council, that are also very careful of what you can and cannot do uh, in this field. And you can have a whole debate of what is desirable, but in the end, as a co-legislator, you need to also operate within the legal boundaries that the treaty provides you. So there is not a whole lot of possibilities, but the points you mentioned, I think, are very important. And they need to uh, they need to be adopted. A huge fight, by the way, uh, the, especially with the. Can you you mentioned the Scandinavians in a different context, but uh, Scandinavians through all across the European Parliament, whether they're from the, uh, the 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 extreme left, the left, the right, or the extreme right, all of them have voted against this because there is a very strong fear that it will undermine the sort of social. Um, social model they have in those in those countries. So it is something you also have to be a little bit careful about. Yeah, if I can add something, that's exactly what I had as a comment. That's it can be very disruptive, both for the EU states with this high minimum wage, or like the Scandinavian countries, and on the other side, the states with the at the bottom of the minimum wage. So we need some time to get closer to each other. So I can imagine that for some states. It can be too much and too too soon. I can add one thing and then I'll, I'll stop. But it's also important because who is high on the minimum wage ladder and who is low is always a matter of perspective, of course. Because if you look at some of the criteria that were uh, uh, desirable for some groups in the parliament as well to say, you need to have at least 50% of um, the average wage or 60% of the median wage. Um, you know, then a country like the Netherlands would be quite far off, while a country like Romania uh, would basically be there already because the average wages are in general lower in some countries than in a country like the Netherlands. And that was not necessarily the idea behind the proposal, namely to also sort of make the gap between member states ultimately smaller, which you don't, at least in objective terms, you don't do with a proposal that refers to such criteria. Yeah, I think it is an incredibly uh, important uh, proposal, and that would really be, uh, I think, the biggest achievement ever if uh, if the EU would succeed in adopting such a, such an instrument. And um, 
I think it's from a social policy perspective. Uh, I think there is a trend in the uh, many of, of the European countries. This is the terrain of the research of the University of Antwerp of Pierre Cantillon, Toulon, that the uh, sort of <laughs> capital is increasing at a larger uh, rate than the, than the income from labor. But if you look at income from labor as a separate category, there there is the the middle classes that profit quite relatively quite well from uh, the economic growth. But this uh, long-term trend that uh, the lower wages are stagnant and that the development lags behind in relation to the uh, average wages, that is quite prevalent in, in, in all Western countries. And that is a huge problem that creates a gap in our society uh, uh, between those who are uh, sort of uh, who, who, who are capable of, of jumping on, on, on the bus in time, you know, usually this is the, the better educated and those who lag behind. It's also a massive, I think, system failure of our uh, systems of labor law that um, the, 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 the national systems are no longer capable of um, uh, realizing jobs that offer uh, a proper standard of living. So it needs to be addressed. Uh, and uh, I think there is also a sentiment in all the member states uh, that uh, the minimum wages should go up. I mean, we've had a long, long period uh, that politicians uh, or entrepreneurs sort of approach the minimum wage as something as an obstacle, you know, for, uh, 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 for, for uh, earning money, uh, for running your, your, your companies. Uh, but now it is considered actually as a, as, as, as a useful instrument of regulating the uh, labor market. So there is momentum. And uh, I think this must be grasped. Uh, and um, as for, there is indeed, there are these differences uh, in approach. I mean, some countries are really totally, uh, it's Austria, but it's Scandinavia, convinced that you shouldn't set a, a statutory level of minimum wage because it's conceived as some Anglo-American uh, minimum, minimal approach so it's much better in much better hands of the social partners other countries don't have that idea but i think looking at the directive i thought the first when i looked at it uh, those both uh, uh, approaches to both setting a minimum wage i.e either by statutory measures or by a process of negotiation between employers and employees are quite well represented in the proposal uh, so i think there, uh, there it, it should stand a, a, a good chance. Lastly, can I say, uh, there's now this also this economic argument uh, uh, that's suddenly popping up, which is gaining momentum. It's, it's very much uh, voiced by Boris Johnson. We do not want to be a low wage economy. A modern forward economy should be the high wage economy. Uh, so it's not only for the protection of uh, workers, but I think uh, there's also a very, very strong argument the, uh, let's say, from the point of view of the development of the economy in the future, it, the economy should change, should not be dependent on cheap worker, but should be uh, uh, taking a high uh, labor productivity as its, uh, as its goal. So I think, go for it, go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you and you are in the parliament. Hmm? It goes to the council. Do you have any insight in what the situation is there, let's say? What are the chances? Was this is minimum wage, and until two, three years ago, I thought this would never succeed. Well, all of it may be, the times have changed. With your, the times are right, perhaps. Right. Is it true? Well, I think I am, I'm always a little bit, um, I think we have to be careful in not raising too high expectations, because sometimes uh, if you look at the, how it is sometimes presented, it is, oh, we're now going to have a, a minimum wage directive at the European level, and it means that within five years, all Europeans will earn three euros more per hour. And I think, in, in all honesty, the only thing that will go through the council in this current composition on minimum wage is something that will basically not change very much in their own member states. Everything that would really create a huge change will not be accepted. I think that's, that's the reality of it. And that doesn't mean that it's, it is without uh, a value, because like you said, uh, the focus on collective bargaining, if you fall below a certain level of representation in collective bargaining, you need to have a national action plan. That is very good, I think. It doesn't, 
It doesn't interfere in the national system, but it does push them to do something. The fact to have clear criteria of what you define as an adequate minimum wage is also very important because it, it, it seems to be a very normal thing to have. Um, but I don't think we can expect something really revolutionary uh, to appear at the end of this process. And it's also only one part, of course, because I think if you talk about low wage economies, etc., it's not only about the height of the level of the minimum wage, it's also about the number of people in a country that earn the minimum wage. Very huge differences in, in the European Union between percentages of people that are covered by the minimum wage uh, or the people covered by collective bargaining agreements, which usually are higher than minimum wages. You also have to look at the whole uh, uh, setting of what kind of tax situation is there, what kind of allowances are there, are there for lower income uh, uh, workers, uh, what kind of child uh, benefits, what kind of child, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, in the opfang, uh, child care. These, these are all part of a mix. And sometimes the problem I find a little bit with uh, having European legislation in this regard is that you always pick up one particular point of the mix, mm -hmm. you legislate that, but you can't touch the other aspects, which which not always uh, not always gives you a, uh, an improvement of the whole situation necessarily. And then one last thing, sorry, really, but <clears throat> there is also a little bit of, of a democratic principle uh, at stake. <laughs> yeah, no, but but Gijs rightfully said it is an issue in many member states. It is a discussion that has had. We just well, we just it's a long time ago by now, but we had elections in the Netherlands. All political parties, yeah, all political parties are in favor. They have different ideas of how high it should be or how it should be done. But then we have elections. There is a governing coalition talks, and they come up with something on the minimum wage, I'm sure. And then it's very strange if you have a sort of a, a parallel process at the European level that then says, okay, well, you decided this now after long democratic debates and elections. But from the European Union, we've decided that it should be rather this. Uh, and I think especially given the treaty and the competences that is, um, you have to be a little bit careful about how you approach it. But... You're a bit of a party spoiler. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Before, uh, <laughs> no, but before what... we move uh... to build on that and not focus on minimum wages, but a minimum income. Which... Sorry, Anne Peter, before we do that. May I just say, for those who are on, on screen and would like to pose questions, they can do so in the chat, uh, and then we collect the questions for the later uh, but you can post them as, as we go in the, in the chat, if you have any. And then, Peter, back to you. Oh, first, we move from minimum wage to minimum income, which is on the agenda, but not as far as the wage yet. Uh, yes, we were, we were rushing through the agenda because, it, uh, because <laughs> there was one more point I wanted to ask Jeroen about minimum wages. No, uh, no, no, no. Um, is, instead of going into this uh, party spoiler uh, thing, <laughs> but, 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 but just to say, say one thing about you know, it's, you don't have everything straight away, you, you throw the seeds with such a directive, more, yeah. more future. In that. So, but the question I, I'm having is uh, my concern is the minimum wages for the self employed. You, you touched upon it, actually. There was a, a proposal of the former uh, Rutte government in the Netherlands, and then uh, for, for setting a, 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 let's say, minimum rate, or trying to realize a minimum wage for the self-employed, for solo self-employed. And then it turned out that this uh, um, raised big, big uh, questions of uh, EU competition law and uh, free market regulation. So it was not implemented. I think that is a bad state. You know, we need this. There's a growing army of self-employed in our labor markets, and they are without any uh, minimum income protection whatsoever. And I think this is a big challenge for the EU, and uh, should not, by re means of a rule of reason, the EU uh, allow more space for uh, national solutions for creating minimum wages for the self-employed. I mean, this is actually on the agenda. At the moment, this is a question I'm happy to you. No, I fully, I won't be a party spoiler uh, here. I, I fully agree with that because I think it is an issue. At the same time, you always have to be careful because in the, in the, in the history of the European Union on social affairs, we've also often seen uh, national measures. If you give too much flexibility, too much space, national measures being used 
um, uh, to to have some sort of a protectionist anti-free movement behavior from certain member states. Uh, we see it also, we've seen it during Corona, we've seen it with the posting of workers directive, where, uh, where due to uh, very bureaucratic control systems or very high demands uh, on uh, posted workers or freedom of providing of services, uh, you, you sort of kill the opportunity of freedom of movement. So I agree, uh, there should be more flexibility to give way to national issues like this, but you have to be a little bit careful to not leave it so free that it will turn out to those members who want to, to kill off the freedom of movement as, uh, as such. Yes, is it currently debated in, uh, in, in the parliament? This, this is a, a debate, but I also think that with when we have the debate on the, um, uh, the platform uh, workers uh, that we are going to have uh, from next week onwards, uh, this will also so be in the sidelines of that debate. Um, of course, it is a little bit difficult, and, but I, I'm, I'm here with three professors, so I'm not going to give any, any, any arguments on this because you know much more about this than I do. But the, the issue of, for instance, freedom of establishment, which is a treaty, is a treaty right, is also a bit more difficult to, to limit in a way through uh, primary or secondary legislation. So I'm not sure whether you could solve this with legislation, with a directive or a regulation at the European level, or whether you should also have a look at what, what space the treaty gives you in that regard. But I, I really leave that question with the professors. Or oh, politicians, so what, there is a will, there is a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may I add uh, something or a question either? If we are talking about the minimum wage for the employees, that could also be very then attractive for the self-employed and for the bogus self-employed, I would say. Yeah? If the protection for the employees is going to be better, then it's not so being not so attractive to get into that bogus self-employment status. So that could be a side effect, I think. Is briefly minimum income. Yes, minimum income is uh, one step ahead, uh, and I think far more complex than uh, than the minimum wage, which is already very complex. Indeed. And as far as I know, it is placed on the agenda, rightly so, as part of the anti-poverty strategy of the European Commission and the part of the realization of the European Social Pillar. Uh, meaning that uh, the Commission is preparing at the moment, as I read, uh, a, a, a recommendation to be issued next year in 2022, so that will be next month, uh, no, starting next month, uh, on on the quality of minimum income protection systems. Now, if we look at the document that has been produced uh, in preparation of this initiative so far, um, uh, I think it uh, points at the fact that it is very, very hard to come up with European solutions by reason of the fact uh, that the definition and the role of minimum income systems in the various member states is very, very diverse. And uh, so there are some member states like ours and in Belgium and uh, in, in, in the UK or uh, uh, Germany. So this is typically we we have this idea that um, the minimum income system is the social system, the safety, social safety net, the final safety net. So we have this clear cut idea. Uh, and um, by reason of that, we can also envisage that you should uh, uh, formulate a couple of qualitative criteria to which these uh, social system schemes should adhere. On that point, I think it is quite possible to think of a, a recommendation, even a directive. Uh, just just uh, on 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 issuing qualitative criteria on it of for these for these social assistance schemes. The problem is when I read it, the document is that this is not reality. Having these social safety nets in many other member states is different. Eastern Europe is different. Than Southern Europe, although uh, the the three big countries uh, of three big countries: Greece, Italy, Spain. Even Portugal have now, as, in, as a result of the COVID, if it was Greece as a result of the big economic crisis, and now the other three countries as a result of COVID introduced uh, a, a general uh, uh, social safety net measures too. So, so perhaps the southern states are, are um, evolving 
in, in that respect. There's still but many, many differences. So the question of definition. So I think, you know, um, I think it is difficult to come with binding uh, uh, measures, but the one thing I want to say about it, if I look at the documents so far, the, uh, the approach is very much economic, sociological, and when it remains economic, sociological, it might be difficult to come up with any EU instruments. So I think <coughs> my suggestion would be is to look at the <coughs> issue a little bit more from a normative, perhaps even a human rights point of view, just by looking at the um, question uh, the right to human dignity, the right to social security, the right to social assistance. What does it mean uh, in uh, in the international case law? What is how is it elaborated upon by the um, uh, so, uh, Committee of Social Rights in the Council of Europe? And then, would it be possible to dis detract, distract from this body of case law, semi case law, a number of qualitative criteria which could be adopted in a regulation. Perhaps that is a, a, a more suitable way forward, a human rights approach to a minimum income protection uh, for, for as a source of inspiration for setting uh, common standards. Okay. Um, I'll take the liberty here to move to, to one more thesis and looking at the time too. And would like to put the next one starting with the European pillar of social rights. Uh, the proposition is the European pillar of social rights is unlikely to make a significant contribution to the goal of protecting work rights. Um, progress can be made. Minimum wages, who knows minimum income, work-life balance, and so forth. But the background of the proposition is a little bit. The pillar originates in the economic crisis. So counterbalance against uh, economic Especially in the southern member states, yeah. situation for many is not too good. Um, what is truly needed from a social perspective is in fields like social security, perhaps the law of the We have the austerity measures, and I don't know the figures, but numerous civil servants companies have lost their job because of austerity measures. Precisely there, where economic negative impact so enormous would expect social counterbalance but precisely when we look at article 153 one of the most important topics social security law is not so perhaps trade union rights the eu has no competence or can only act with unanimity in light of that should we looking at the future conference of europe is there a need to change the competences for example, the conference, conference on the future of Europe. Should we change something? Is this feasible? Yes or no? Should we, and is it feasible, are, are two different questions. I think on the feasibility, I would say no. If you see with how much effort it took, how much difficulties it raised to get all the member states to, um, to sign the European Pillar of Social Rights, uh, to go any further than that, I think in the in the near future is, is simply not um, is simply not feasible. And I think that European pillar of social rights. I've also sometimes thought for is it that important? Is it not? It's, it's only a relatively big set of principles. But I, looking back at it, I do think it has been important because I also think the um, sort of the, the the more social approach by Juncker and his commission was not necessarily only a reaction to the economic crisis but also maybe combined with the economic crisis, a reaction to many years of too much neoliberalism at the European Union, only looking at the market, economic growth, <coughs> and forgetting the aspect of the social market economy. We only had uh, an economic semester. We didn't have a social semester. So I think the, the approach that Juncker took, that we should go from you know, only being a financial triple A status, also have a social triple A status, and that sort of, in the end, resulted in this pillar of social rights. In the concrete policy, it might not have been so important, but I think in the mentality and the way we look at social policy at the European Union has made a huge impact. And in terms of competences, 
uh, I mean, we haven't talked about social security coordination uh, yet, mm. but it's it's a, it's a legislation that's been on the table for five years now that I've worked on. And if you look at the huge differences in both the social security systems of uh, the member states, the interests of the member states, uh, I don't think changing the competences would solve anything. You need to have also somewhat of a, of a general idea of where you want to go before competences become relevant, because as long as you don't have that, you can have all the competences in the world, but you'll never reach uh, any, any sort of improvement. Yeah, on that uh, European pillar of social rights, I would say, yes, give it some time. Eh? Um, I would not say it's unlikely. I just say, well, give it some time because you already have uh, directly um, from the European pillar, we have that recommendation for access to, so, to social security for workers and self-employed. So there is already some movement going forward. And there you can see that also that will be yeah, will be welcomed by many countries. And like, for example, in the Netherlands, we have that very bad position, social security position for the self-employed, for many of them, for the solo self-employed, certainly at the bottom of the labor market. But these people could be helped if we say you need that adequate social protection, like the recommendation says. So that could be a very good policy um, trigger for our government to at least organize a good social protection for all workers. You might, and I also think, uh, to, to end uh, on a positive note, that the, um, the policy trigger, as you, uh, Saskia, re uh, referred to it, it's, 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 a, it's a good concept, must not be underestimated the power of such a uh, uh, European policy trigger. And I noticed this, um, I've been uh, involved on the sideline in the German uh, discussion on the extension of the German rent uh, social insurance system to the self-employed as a result of uh, the, the, the recommendation on the uh, social protection for workers. Um, uh, there uh, was a um, discussion led by the Bundesministerium uh, für Arbeit, so I was there in Berlin, and then I noticed that this was absolutely not conceived as a German issue, but entirely framed as something that is now coming from Brussels and Germany should adhere. Now, I know Germany is perhaps a little bit the best, the best child of the classroom uh, in these sort of things. But I, I, I you know, uh, the, the once, I, I wouldn't say that the European pillar is totally worthless by lack of competences. There was also the, let's say, the political uh, impact that it may have. And so that should not be underestimated. Maybe a little bit on the question, but this, sometimes I cannot suppress the feeling that the pillar of social rights is also developed for union's own sake, rather than for, for the image of the union. Um, measures. The EU is not that image. Oh, the EU is only there for the companies and for the money. And I, when I look at the minimum wage and what the proposals, sometimes you think, wait a minute, we can just as well do this at the national level. We, don't. we can direct, we can do a recommendation. There is a push, and I'm not just saying it's a bad thing, but I cannot express sometimes the feeling that in Brussels, we want to show too much that the EU is social and therefore it should be done at European level. The member states are part of the EU. If something happens, my work national is fine too. The push I do not always understand, or am I no missing the point here, or am I unfair to it? You are very you are very unfair at the moment. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I think you're partly right, but I, I think the, the the social pillar was came from a genuine uh, feeling, especially in the Juncker Commission, that the European Union in recent times had not done enough on social uh, affairs, on protection of workers, and they wanted to compensate, they wanted to do more. And at the same time, they also wanted to improve the image of the European Union in that area. But at the same time, um, you say, yes, but we can also do this at the national level. I agree. And if it would be done at the national level, you wouldn't have to do European initiatives. But I remember, because you mentioned my internship was with Ria Omer. She was in the parliament for 25 years. And we were discussing the work life balance. It's the same question. 
why should it be done at the European level? Why can't you do it at the national level? And then she said, well, it was the same with maternity leave. But if the European Union hadn't done it in the Netherlands, we would now still be lagging yeah, behind. Exactly. So yeah. at, at some point, yes, the European Member States can do it, but we have also uh, all agreed to a certain level, a minimum level of welfare, of employment, on, 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 on health. These are all issues that we have committed to and we also need to deliver on. And is are the European institutions then, I'm just pushing it a little bit further, what mm -hmm. I, uh -huh. um, but to do with Southern and Eastern Europe, because I read, for example, about the minimum income, I think it was, mm -hmm. the Eurobarometer bar poll, two thirds support for it. Huh? Two thirds. Two thirds, and in all the Eastern European countries, the Southern yeah. European Europe should do something in the hope of convergence mm -hmm. towards, yeah. in the richer countries, Oh, Europe, stay away. There's no support for it. So everybody, hmm? listen. And I think the whole construction benefits from competition between all sorts of levels of government, and that uh, results in, let's say, the the, the, the uh, engineering and uh, change in the systems in a forward manner. Now, if you have entire, if only if you would have a Soviet style Politburo centralism. That would obviously not operate as a uh, motor for positive change. But what is so beautiful about uh, Europe, mind you, the same thing, <laughs> I, but you, you should talk about that. I should not be the one. It's the same situation in the United States. Of course, there is always the, the, the question, should uh, uh, social policy be at the hands of the states or should Washington take over and, and set? But the, 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 the reality is, of course, that both levels compete for these competences, and uh, which results in a pleasant upward dynamic. Um, so if the EU has certain, uh, let's say, selfish motive, uh, 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 promoting uh, its social agenda, doesn't matter. In a context whereby 90% of the competences are still with the member states. You know, it, 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 it stimulates the, the, the discussion. One more general point, maybe, because I, I really dislike this um, idea of the EU being somewhere here as an entity and the member states being somewhere there as an entity. The EU is the member states. Right? The EU is 27 member states. The European Parliament is parliamentarians elected in these 27 member states. And sometimes I, I, I really dislike the, the, the framing we have as if there are somewhat on, on two different islands and sometimes you cross the, the sea to go to Brussels and you fight for your national interest and either you win or you lose and you go back. I think this is exactly the frame which, which makes it very hard uh, to, to keep momentum in the European Union and to keep public support. I think we really should look at the European Union much more as an integrated uh, body of which all 27 member states are part of. The European social pillar is not an EU thing. It is all 27 member states that undersign this. It, it's their policy. It's not an E. And this is, I'm not, maybe I'm not except explaining Greeks, it right. Except the Greeks. That's a joke. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, think, I, think because I think the European, the sustainability, the long term sustainability of the European Union is really hurt if we only look at it as a, as a separate entity. It is, it is not, it, it, is, it, it interacts on so many different levels. And I think that is also a story we need to, uh, we need to, Tell a narrative we need to tell much more. I can see that time, this is an extremely rich discussion and we could sit here all evening, I think. Uh, I can see time is upon us. We have a little over five minutes left. Did you want to introduce any other propositions, Antipro? Did you want to go to the chat? <laughs> we don't have any questions in the chat at the moment, so we continue talking or? No, okay, then I take the opportunity to briefly move to social security. We're already referring to it. Um, and we have freedom of movement, changes in social security systems. The Commission has come up with a proposal to update, modernize uh, Regulation 883 on the coordination of social security. That is really in 2016, I think it started. Um, but in the last two years, I hear very little about it. And the negotiations are stuck. Can you give us a brief update? And is it true that the Netherlands export 
but unemployment benefits is a major obstacle? Uh, no, that's not true, uh, because that is, a, that is a, a battle, I think, in all fairness, that the Netherlands has, uh, has lost. There are a number, a number of member states that have issues with a prolongation of the um, export periods for unemployment benefits. In the Netherlands, this was because mainly the, um, the news coverage also on, on the Polish issues. We have a lot of uh, Polish citizens who export their unemployment benefits to Poland, but only 0.6% of them actually find a job during this export period, which you know, raises the question, if we double it to six months, is that going to increase chances of finding employment or not? Because in the end, that is what unemployment benefits are also intended for. So this was a very... A very uh, strong debate in the Netherlands, in uh, Belgium, in some other member states, the Scandinavians as well. But I also have to say, to be honest, that it's a political issue. It, it's it's not a it's not an economic issue because the amount of costs involved in these exports of unemployment benefits is, I think, a number that they don't even use at the Ministry of Social Affairs to round off uh, the budget. It, it's not an economic issue; it's a political issue. What is the political issue then? The political issue is that there are uh, a huge political debate about uh, the context in which we have in many countries debates about social policy at the European level or freedom of movement is that freedom of movements, according to some political parties, is a burden. Mem people that come from other countries who work here do that uh, only to take advantage of the generous Dutch system, etc., etc. This, this is a very difficult uh, debate in, in which... In many countries, indeed. But it's, it's not, if you look at it objectively as an economic issue, it is not that big of a problem. But also, it's not the topic in the current negotiation anymore, because that battle has been fought and lost. The Netherlands and uh, five, six other member states will, for that reason, maybe abstain or vote against the proposal, whatever comes out of it now. The big issue on the table now is uh, what to do with issues like prior notification of uh, your, your PDA1. Social security um, the situation because in the old regulation it said whenever possible you should request your PDA one in advance and of course whenever possible if you want to abuse the system it's never uh, if, uh, yeah, sorry but... um, so that for the parliament was a, a, a huge problem so we want to have a more uh, specific uh, also to improve enforcement. Uh, more rules on prior notification, on pluriactivity, activity, to make sure that we can actually calculate properly whether you are uh, should be insured in the member states where you say you are insured, or you should be uh, socially insured or post member state. Very technical, um, but it, it, I would say this is about five percent of, of the actual work on the revision of 883, uh, but it's causing a massive headaches because there is a group of member states. Uh, led by Poland mainly, who do not want any of this because they feel it is an obstacle to, um, to free movement. And there's another group of member states um, that really also want this notion of uh, a fair mobility to make sure that we can address social abuse um, and, and, and companies taking advantage. And uh, as you remember, uh, we had a deal under the Romanian presidency in 2019, uh, but that deal collapsed in the council. They didn't get a majority for it. So we had to take it back after the elections. And then basically, politically speaking, the council came back that, yes, we've spoken to Poland. And if you do this, this, and this parliament, uh, then we can have a deal. I'm sorry, but this is, not, this is not the way we negotiate. And we are four or five presidencies further down the road, and we're not, uh, not really anywhere near... Uh, no, not, no well, to give to give to give one example, um, we are currently under the Slovenian presidency. There were informal talks with the Slovenian presidency. They came up with a proposal. As a parliament, we asked, "Okay, we are willing to negotiate on the basis of the proposal, as long as you come back with a mandate from the council that this is a proposal that is carried by the council, and there is still room for negotiation, also to move towards the parliament." Uh, and since then, it has been uh, it has been silent again. So, so would it be fair to say then that the present text of Regulation 83 represents the best compromise between the interests of all the member states, more than the proposal 
No, I don't think so, uh, because uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't think so, because uh, this is only a very small part of 83. I don't have to explain to the professors uh, how elaborate the whole legislation of 83 is. So I think it would be a huge mistake to let all the progress we have in the other areas of 83, when it comes, for instance, to long-term illness, long-term care, huge improvements made that are all very universally uh, supported by member states to let that uh, fall down because we can't agree on these issues. And we need to look at different solutions, but I don't think the status quo is, is optimal either. Well, on, on, this, uh, on this note, uh, Anne Peter, I think uh, Europe wasn't built in a day, but uh, we are uh, uh, certain that this is moving in the, in the right uh, direction. And on this, I want to uh, close uh, this, uh, this fireplace talk for today. Thank you very much to all the audience online for following us. Thank you, uh, Jeroen and Kai and Saskia for joining and of course, Anne Peter for uh, leading and providing this uh, so many thought engaging um, uh, statements. Um, till the next uh, Fireplace Talk, please stay tuned uh, on, on our website, on the website of Campus Brussels, on our social media uh, for uh, the following events, which will be in the new year as of uh, January. Thank you very much and have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you.